How are New Yorkers coping at the center of the world's financial meltdown? My guest today on Hard Talk is one of the Big Apple's most celebrated sons, a world-renowned author and for many, a literary giant. Where does he put the credit crunch on the scale of disasters that have hit New York? Paul Oster, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Good. What's it like being a New Yorker these days in the credit crunch? Well, you know, we've been through so many things in New York in the last years. This has been a rough decade, huh? And um, I think people are scared. Uh, I even know someone who works for my publishing company in New York who took all her money out of the bank and is literally hiding it under her mattress now. So there is that Just doesn't kind trust of fear. the banks. Panic, panic. And um, I think the one thing that will end the crisis is the end of panic. Uh, it's, a, it's a snowball that just keeps growing. Um, I just ask you, Governor David Patterson of New York says, every time anybody hears that Wall Street has had a bad day, you can just know that New York has had an even worse day. So what's that panic about? Is it people are scared about losing their jobs, that's their livelihoods? It. That's it, jobs. And I, I think... Uh, well, you know, uh, Lehman Brothers is finished. So all these people are out of work. Um, uh, Merrill Lynch has been uh, folded up into another company now. So lots of people who are making enormous salaries are suddenly uh, without, without employment. But it's not just those with enormous salaries. I mean, well, is it? I mean, it, Wall Street it, apparently... Then it, then it moves down, it moves down. because businesses start to fail as their stocks plunge and then they have to release people fire them and uh and then these people can't afford their apartments or houses anymore they move out of the city so it's a tough time uh, who are people blaming are they playing the blame game as far as i can tell it's um uh the feeling that the reagan years of deregulation this this long surge of conservative thinking that we've had that has said that government is bad and just let the markets take care of themselves Milton Friedman economics, um, and if you have oh, what, I, surely, what I would are call... Are you saying that you, you, you run into, I don't know, doorman yeah. taxman who says to me, I blame that Chicago School of Economics, well, but it's, Milton it's Friedman well, and all but they the don't say it in those <laughs> words, but, but that's, that's the implication. We let these people run wild, and, uh, and now the system is collapsing. But are they saying that in terms of the political narrative? Are they saying it's because of the Republicans? I mean, we know that New York obviously is a democratic state. No, I don't think so, because, um, you know, the Democrats are just as responsible. Uh, deregulation started with Carter, not with Reagan. Reagan stepped up the pace. And, and a lot under Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton as well. There was a lot of more deregulation with him. Um, but it's gotten worse under Bush uh, because one feels that the entire structures of not just the financial system but the government have crumbled. And um, so I think people are very nervous in New York right now and nervous across the country. And when you see what's going on here in Britain with British leaders like the Prime Minister Gordon Brown says we must reward success not excess very much pointing the finger at the bankers and some of the mm. excesses mm. amongst the financial mm. institutions. Do you see that in New York? Do people say, it's those fat cats on Wall Street, there, we there blame that, them? You know, on the street, you know, the Mr. Average Joe, if there is such a thing as a Mr. Average Joe... It's, what about it's Mrs. Feeling, Average Joe, Mrs. Anna? Average Joe, <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're feeling this way. People uh, have been out of the system and uh, they don't really understand the financial world. I'm not so steady on it myself, to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> no, so there is this impression. feeling of resentment, yeah. yeah. So they don't see it as, look, Wall Street provided a great deal of employment one way or another for the ordinary non-Wall Street person in New York. They do see it as the excesses of greed. Well, we, so read, we lived through something um, in 1987. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a crash. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, it doesn't compare with the scope of this one, but mm -hmm. it was very, very serious. And what you saw was people who had been working on Wall Street leaving and therefore many empty apartments and then the housing market went down in New York City and um, and I think 
the same thing is going to happen now. So it's going to be hard times for a lot of people. Mayor Mike Bloomberg of New York says, look, constitutionally, it's not right, but I want it changed and I want to run for a third term because I'm a billionaire and understand finance mm -hmm. and I can help get New York out of this. Is that something you would support? No. Uh, if you remember, uh, Giuliani wanted to do the same thing. He said the city's in crisis now and... After they, September they, the 11th. They, exactly. They Giuliani. need me so I should have a third term. Uh, people scoffed at it and, and it was dropped. And unfortunately for Bloomberg, the same thing holds true. Uh, these term limits, I think, make sense. And um, he's about to end his second term. He's done a pretty good job overall. Uh, but it's time to elect somebody else. But I mean, that is one of the effects, the consequences of this crisis, is that we are seeing the politicians accrue so much more power to themselves with the very activist, interventionist role they're taking in the situation. Well, you see, there with Bloomberg, it's. Um, He's saying, I'm an expert, I'm part of the elite, and I can solve the problems for you. Well, we live in a democracy, and the laws are the laws, and we have to move on. What's so interesting to me is that this long-term, 40-year conservative movement, which has harped on one issue again and again, without cease, government is bad. The less government, the better. And how ironic now that they're crazy system is finally collapsing, <laughs> that we have government intervention on a scale that is unprecedented in the history of the country. Now, we know you were very shaken by, as so many other people in New York and elsewhere, of course, were shaken by the events of September the 11th. How do you judge this financial meltdown, which is affecting just about everybody in America and the world? Well, I, I, the, September 11th, 2001, was so much more traumatic than this because we were talking about death on a very large scale, and destruction uh, in a way that was unimaginable to people. And when you're dealing with such death, um, it, uh, it, 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 it's so wrenching. I, I, I always looked at 2001, September 11th, as a kind of family tragedy in New York. There were very few people who didn't know somebody, didn't know somebody who had lost mm -hmm. a friend or a relative in, in the attacks. And so it was a shared grief. It had the same emotional impact of someone telling you that your mother and father and all your siblings had been killed in a car crash yesterday. And so you had to deal with that sense of loss. And um, How do you describe what's going on in New York now with the now, current crisis in it, terms it, of emotions? Well, people, people are scared, but it, it doesn't have that gigantic emotional resonance. And I think most people feel that it's going to get fixed, that we're not going to sink into cannibalism. I mean, it's, uh, it's, the, the, the stock markets will adjust themselves eventually. We're just going through a tough time. Your new book, which I have here, Man in the Dark, is a kind of story within a story, isn't it? I mean, it's quite a complicated plot. Well, there's a, a man <laughs> lying in bed, unable to sleep, and so he makes up different stories. So, okay, and yeah. how far is it, do you think, a response to the events of September the 11th and then the Iraq war? Well, it's not so much, well, there is a lot mm -hmm. to do with the Iraq war in the book. There in is, fact, I the, saw that, the, yeah. central, the central event of the book is something that takes place in Iraq. But the story that my narrator, protagonist, August Brill, makes Brilliant up... Brilliant name, by the way. Yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> Shining in the dark. Um, he... Um, he, he imagines another America, mm. America that's engaged in a civil war because states after the 2000 election seceded. And so he, he throws a hapless character into the middle of this conflict and sees what happens to him. Uh, and I think I was inspired to write this and give him this story because of the anger and frustration I felt over that election. It, it seemed to me that it was obvious that Al Gore won. He was elected president of the United States. And then through political and legal maneuverings, the Republicans took it away from well, him. Of course, legally, they would say, legitimately, George Bush was the winner. But yes, we don't need to revisit all that. But you felt very sore But you felt very sore It was about an outrageous this. decision, in my opinion. So I've had this eerie sense in the last eight years that we're not really living in the real world, that we've jumped into some parallel shadow world. The real world for me is 
one in which Al Gore is finishing up his second term. America never invaded Iraq. Possibly 9-11 never happened. I mean, this is just a dream. It's not uh, something that I um, will insist upon as reality. So that, that's the, ba the basis. So that's, that's the what basis. inspired that's that. That's the basis. But I have to say, I mean, we'll come on to the divisions that you see in America in a moment. But, you, you know, people have criticized you for saying, look, should you really subject things like September the 11th, the Iraq war, to literary games, which is what the Jewish Chronicle said, that this can alienate uh, and offend readers when you do just uh, that. Well, luckily, I don't read reviews of my books. So I don't know what the Jewish <laughs> Chronicle said. Why don't you read <laughs> it said that? Yeah. I mean, the fact that, you know, these are, are very difficult topics and they just say that, look, it, it does offend and alienate view, uh, readers. We don't think that this is suitable topic for the kind of well, literary game you're playing. Listen, no book is going to appeal to everybody. And, um, and I think... Uh, if, if there's split opinion about something, it means that you're, you're shaking people up in a certain way. I certainly did not write this book to offend anyone. It's, it's about real life and real suffering and pain. And but as a New Yorker, do you feel that you had a kind of a special reason to write about September the 11th and then the Iraq war and that but kind of thing? September 11th doesn't figure it doesn't, in this but because Iraq war came yes. after September the 11th, yes. so it's a kind of trigger. It's wrapped up in all that kind of narrative. But do you feel that you kind of should be able to comment on that as a New Yorker? As anybody can comment on anything, and a novel is a very flexible form, and everything is possible in a novel. And the minute a writer says to himself, well, I can't write about this and I can't write about that, then you're, you're failing your art. Why don't you read your own reviews? <laughs> because I can't... No, nothing good can come of it. If but someone some are good. Says, oh, of course, you're most so of, the, most of the them world. are good. But it doesn't help me to read the good ones. And it certainly doesn't help me to read the bad ones. So Why would you I be just, so demoralized by them? <laughs> well, you know, every once in a while, one stumbles across an attack, and, and it, the words sting, and then um, it... it um, it's something you're better off not having to walk around with. Okay, so you say how you mention in your new book that George Bush has declared war on these 16 breakaway states, including New York, 80,000 people killed in New York alone. Is that how you see America today at war with itself? Well, this is a very exaggerated scenario that hmm. I've uh, put in, as, as you understand. It's a man making up a story in his head. But there is a kind of civil war going on in the United States. It's not being fought with bullets and guns, but with words and ideas. And we are divided. And uh, I, I see the gap widening every day. And it's becoming harder and harder for the two sides to communicate. But you're going that far. You're saying people can't even talk to one another anymore. It will. It's, how is it possible for someone who believes the world was created in six days to have a rational conversation with me who doesn't believe that about other possibilities you know when people feel they own the truth then they 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 are not open to dialogue anymore and um, I mean both sides are guilty but you're condemning everybody who has faith then no not at all I'm saying both sides are guilty uh, there's been a, a irritation among the secular Americans with the ultra religious Americans and, and vice versa. And um, I mean, when we're Is that when what you living, see the divide based when, when on, then, living, on religion? Is that what you see the, the division? Well, that's one of the main things. I mean, when you have people who are uh, working in abortion clinics who have to go to work wearing bulletproof vests, you know that something is wrong about the culture. Um, there's, there's too much hatred, and, and we, need to, we need to somehow find a way to come together and yeah. tolerate. A variety of opinions but and beliefs. But surely you're the talking world. there about a small, albeit vociferous, minority, really, that small conservative base who go around targeting doctors in abortion clinics. Most Americans are not like that. Of course not. Of course not. So but it's just a tiny number, really, you, you of, mentioned. The, of the fanatics. But, but I did read, I was in Spain recently, and I was reading a, a poll in one of the newspapers, La Vanguardia, and it said that 44% of Americans did not believe in the theory of evolution. 
So that's almost half the country. And most people, actually, one way or another, support abortion rights. You know, most that, that extreme do. group that say, mm. even in the cases of incest or rape on a child or whatever, we mm. won't allow it. Yeah. That's not the real America. So therefore, I ask you, who, who are you talking about then when you say America's at war with itself? You make it sound like it is, it's a much bigger problem than perhaps it really is. Well, because, you see, politically, the people who maybe that 30%, 40% mm -hmm. uh, have had uh, extra power beyond the numbers of people who believe in those ideas. And it has a lot to do with our um, federal system. You know, Wyoming has two senators, and California has two senators. The population of Wyoming is about 200,000, and California is over 30 million. So, obviously, a, a Wyoming voter has a lot more influence in the Senate than a California voter has. And it's this disparity that has made the um, arguments somehow equal, even if smaller numbers of people support one side. And do you see the divisions between Americans as based on anything else other than religion? I mean, you talk about the, the culture wars and this war in America, the divide is so great. Um, it seems to be that that is the fissure point. It's, 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 mostly it's, religion. Yes, mostly religion. Yeah. It's not because, you know, we were reading about supporters of Barack Obama being the drinkers of the skinny lattes and the wine and those <laughs> well, who that, might support that, John McCain, those, the beer and tea drinkers. Those are, you know, cultural <laughs> irritations more than anything else. Um, you know, the country versus the city. We've had these things in every culture, not just America, since the beginning of time, I think. And there's nothing inherently evil in that or wrong with that no it's Those nasty differences. it's nasty and unpleasant to listen to people talking that way but it's not dangerous and when you talk about this strong conservative base in america i mean obviously we've got a presidential election very soon you're a supporter of barack obama do you think there are more people in america who can't bring themselves to vote for a black man than are willing to actually say on the record well this is this is the big fear i have um because under normal historical circumstances, after a failed administration in one party, the other party will inevitably win the next presidential election. So the Democrats should win. But we have this new factor. We have a candidate is the first black candidate ever from a major party, which is already an extraordinary thing. I'm very proud of America for doing this, I have to say. But when the day comes, November 4th, how many white people will go in and say to themselves, I should be voting Democratic, but I can't vote for a black man. Do you really think that's the case? I mean, there are people like Peter Fenn, very respected Democratic strategic mm. thinker strategist, who says, look, with the economy the way it is, nobody's going to reignite the culture wars. I mean, that's when the chips are down, they'll think he might, might be right. Change. He might be right. I hope he's right. I'd like to. I'd like to see Obama win. Could you be inspired in any way to write about the financial meltdown in time? in time, hmm? um, I have to do a lot of studying. I have to read a lot of economics. Because <laughs> you want to become an economic expert. <laughs> <laughs> but um, do you think that um, Jean-Marie Gustave Le Clésio has just won the Nobel Prize for Literature? And you know what the head of the award committee, Swedish chap Horace Engdahl, said was that, look, America, American yes. writers, can never really dominate the, the cultural world because they're too insular and, and too ignorant of, of the outer world. I mean, do you think he has a point? Uh, no, I don't. I, I think there are, are incredibly gifted American novelists of every aesthetic stripe uh, creating uh, very good literature. And, uh, and, and the world is reading this, too. It's not as though um, people are ignoring American writers. No, I mean, Toni I mean, Morrison won the Nobel sure. Prize in 93. You've got Philip Roth. Yourself, of course. That's right. Well, look, I'm sitting here with you, um, uh, and I'm, I'm from America. Um, I just think it's a wrong-headed view. I don't know what possessed him to say it. Um, but, but, I mean, actually, when you look at it, though, I mean, it's not just America, but big nations can have a kind of certain insularity about them. And, I mean, for instance, America translates very little fiction ah, from other languages. Oh, I'll give you a figure, I, actually. You might be surprised to hear this. Two uh, percent of American literature is I, translated from so a foreign I'm, language. I'm, I'm France, 27 percent. No, I know all mm. about this. You know, I've been vice president of Penn, American Center. Okay. And I know all these statistics. So why, then? So why? But, you see, I agree the culture is shutting itself off from the rest of the world. Yeah. We don't distribute foreign movies. We don't translate enough books. But that wasn't the question. We're talking about the writers in America 
transcend the culture in a certain way. And um, we have some brilliant masters of, of fiction and, and poetry. But when I mean, you look at what American writers, fair to say, okay, broad sweep, that they do tend to talk about the American experience much more than European writers do. I mean, if you take Leclesio, he says, I don't write about France as such at all. I've lived in Mauritius, Nigeria, right. I've lived in Central America with the native Indians, and that's what I write about. And, and, and that's more typical, perhaps, of the kind of European writers who've won the Nobel Prize in the past. Oh, I don't know. Uh, um, I'm just trying to think. Harold Pinter, who won from England, he's really very much writing about England all the time. Jelinek, who won, she's writing about Austria. Um, no, I think Leclesio is think in a it, separate category. He's a very interesting writer. I'm glad he won. And, um, but he, there are very few writers from any culture who are as open-minded as he is about other cultures. I mean, maybe you're perhaps not typical of American writers, because your friend, the British writer Salman Rushdie, says, close friend of yours, you have a European sensibility which bears on entirely American subject matter. You speak French fluently, for instance. So perhaps would you agree that you're not the typical American writer? No, I'm not. I'm probably not. Um, uh, and I, I feel interested in the entire world. And... Um, but, but there are other American writers, too, who, who, who do get out of their little cocoon and uh, look around and try to absorb what's going on elsewhere. Do you think that the events of September the 11th and the Iraq war have begun to change what Hari Seng Dahl said, you know, that the U.S. is too insular and ignorant to challenge Europe as, as a centre of the literary world, that perhaps American writers, one way or another, are beginning to see the outside world more. It's possible, but I, I just have to reiterate that uh, people have been writing about all kinds of things from the very beginning. You think one of our great writers, Henry James, was writing about that interesting clash between the American sensibility and the European sensibility. Um, so that's at the, you know, the beginning of the, our, our literature. Um, but you think about writers like John DeLillo and mm -hmm. E.L. Doctorow and John Updike and Philip Roth, uh, just to name a few, Kurt Vonnegut who died recently, Norman Mailer who died recently, Styron, these are big Can writers. Can give us a long list there? But these yeah. are really interesting writers. They're all different. Every name evokes something completely different, but so, it's strong work. So are you then, as a very well-known American writer, going to be writing to the head of the committee for the Nobel Prize for literature, Harvey Sengdahl, and, and try to put him straight and say, we're going to send you a new reading this, I, Mr. Engdahl. I just think it's too tedious to get involved in these kinds of arguments. I, I, I feel my job is just to keep pushing on with my own work, and that's what I'm trying to do every day. So you've and just... he can say what he wants, and I'll do what I want. But it's upsetting. Don't you want to challenge it? No, no, no. I, mean, we, I already have, right here with you, so <laughs> I don't have to write about it now. Okay, Paul Oster, thank you very much for Thank coming you. on Hard Talk. Thanks for thank having you. me.